Hello, everyone. It's nice to see all of you here. Uh, some of you were on the previous talk, and uh, those of you who were then uh, will probably better understand what uh, I will say. My name is Łukasz. I work at Samsung R&D Institute Poland. Today, I would like to share with you an idea we've got in my team. We decided to replace uh, a bootloader on one of our development platforms with Linux kernel and the handful of user LAMP tools. Uh, this by no means is uh, something new. We, we did it because others did it before us. And uh, here on FOSDEM, I, I have already seen at least two talks about it. So, but we've got our approach, which I would like to share with you. We think there are several good reasons to do that. One of them, us being a little bit lazy, as probably some of you here too, uh, and liking others to help us do our job. We want to avoid double effort that is required to develop the, to bring up a new platform because uh, code for both Linux kernel and the bootloader needs to be developed to, to get a functional platform. Uh, and there is, we think there is uh, no need to, to do, to create code for both uh, and Linux and bootloader. Uh, because the talk is rather short, I, and I really don't want to miss the ending, I will do my best to tell you everything I've got, and uh, then I will answer your questions. Uh, this presentation has got two, two parts, unlike what's on the screen. The first describes more or less the current state of publicly available bootloaders on ARM Cortex-A CPUs. Uh, Angelo said a lot more uh, about that. Uh, the second is about our work, how we think uh, it is possible to improve the situation. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar with uh, the topic, on ARM there is no standard firmware like uh, BIOS or UEFI on x86. That is why it is a bootloader's job to configure most important hardware components. Uh, let me ask, how many of you have touched a bootloader code or an architecture-dependent Linux code uh, that runs before start kernel function? Just like, okay, <laughs> we're on the same page. That's nice. Uh, in this, maybe some of you are, are more clever than I am. Uh, in this presentation, I will assume the booting process comprises the following uh, stages. The firmware is a piece of, uh, this is what others call the RBL, Angelo called it RBL. This is a piece of immutable code that comes uh, with a CPU. It cannot be changed by any means. Then there is a bootloader, AKA SPL divided into several stages. And then, the, of course, there is an OS, the code that uh, implements the application the device was designed for, like desktop environment or multimedia system or uh, choose yours. Uh, an additional task bootloaders sometimes perform is an OS update especially when uh, the OS is broken. Uh, this means a bootloader should be very robust, uh, as it may be the only way to unbreak a device. Uh, we concluded that the available bootloaders for ARM have so significant drawbacks, and we need to improve upon that. The f following the experience of the Linux boot project, we decided to use Linux as a bootloader. Uh, these are the three most common bootloaders I could find for ARM. Each of them support different ar architectures too. Uh, there is a lot more proprietary, commercial, custom ones. Until now, in our work, we have used U-Boot on most development platforms and some custom bootloaders on, on products. Uh, every new platform 
needs a bootloader to be ported to it. You know, you build a PCB, you smash uh, an SOC onto it, to, to boot it, you, you need a bootloader. Uh, just to repeat, I mean all the code from that is loaded by, uh, from ROM un that runs until uh, Linux kicks in. So that's what I consider a bootloader. Uh, porting a bootloader to a new platform requires writing platform setup code, which will configure, plat uh, which will configure the platform to be usable. It turns on DRAM, some clocks, some uh, some uh, voltage, some voltages on board, uh, some basic peripherals like console. Uh, then there is a general purpose code. Uh, which deals with loading OS kernel from a storage or from a network and starting it. In addition, in traditional bootloaders, the range of options here in this area is somewhat limited. Uh, for, uh, on the other hand, for Linux, there are tons of device drivers, dozens of file systems, and a more than one network stack too. And thanks to kexec, Linux can act as a bootloader uh, and start completely new kernel, load it from wherever you want and, uh, and uh, start it as a new system. Uh, this is Odroid XU4. It is based on Exynos 5422 SOC and it has been a reference platform for uh, Tizen OS for the past couple of years, and almost everyone in our office has one in their drawer. That's why, uh, that's why we chose it for, for this proof of concept. Uh, it's well supported in the mainline Linux, and we knew that if it doesn't boot, then it is our fault, we're, we're doing something wrong. Uh, it wasn't entirely true, but that's not the point. <laughs> Now, we, we fixed uh, like probably two bugs somewhere in decompressor uh, code that nobody uh, looks into, it works, and we did something different and it appeared uh, a fix was needed. Uh, there have been a, a number of similar attempts to push Linux as close to, to hardware as possible. Uh, mostly on x86 uh, x platforms and uh, as I uh, as I learned today on uh, risk 5 too we work with arm platform and thus our approach is slightly different please do keep in mind also that this was kind of a side project uh, and we focused on getting the most important functionality available and uh, we're not bothered by any convenience feature too much. Uh, okay, the boot on Odroid looks as follows. There are three blobs provided by uh, the vendor, which is uh, hard kernel, uh, and they are uh, flashed with a special, with a, with appropriate script, they are flashed onto SD or EMMC uh, card uh, so so the board can boot. Uh, BL1 does the very basic platform setup uh, which is uh, turning on DRAM and reads uh, BL2. BL2 loads uh, trust zone and, uh, and an unsigned U-boot uh, uh, image. Uh, trust zone uh, uh, blob appears to be doing nothing because there are a, a lot of null bytes, so we don't have source code, uh, source code for it. It doesn't do anything, I think. Uh, no, it, it, it doesn't behave wrong. Uh, we, we don't have any problems with it. Let's stay with that. Uh, all three blobs uh, need to, these three blobs need to be signed. Uh, hard kernel signs uh, tr uh, trust zone handler and BL2 upon request on their forum, uh, but uh, this is a little bit cumbersome to, to change them, so we decided 
uh, we will replace uh, U-boot, just U-boot. No, we, we didn't replace any, any of these. Uh, there is, however, as you might see, uh, there is the name of the last, uh, the last, no, the BL2, uh, suggests the largest hurdle we faced. That is one megabyte limit on the, uh, on the U-boot image. We had to, uh, we had to fit within that limit. After a quick recap, we found these four tasks were essen essential to boot, uh, the, boot the board with, uh, with uh, Linux kernel as a bootloader. Platform setup. As I said, this was rather quick. Uh, the BL1 and BL2 code does all of the setup except for console. We did console with a small, I don't know, 50, 60 bytes uh, shim. That's, that's easy. One megabyte is very, very little for a kernel, device tree, and uh, reasonable, reasonable, whatever that means, user land. After disabling mo almost everything in kernel, what we could, uh, our Z image uh, took like 950 kilobytes, so we, we were left with uh, 50 or 60 kilobytes for, uh, for the user land part. Uh, for the record, uh, without uh, such, uh, uh, such strict limit, we would uh, build a separate bootloading kernel anyway with different configuration than, uh, than the one we used for, uh, for the OS. So two kernels is, uh, are always, we think, required Maybe not. Uh, so maybe the first one could not could be not that much limited. Uh, uh, Linux. Uh, luckily, K, uh, luckily, K exec worked. Uh, however, we had recently some other boards which had some problems with uh, with uh, K exec. Uh, it appears to be the problem with drivers of some devices that don't shut down devices properly, and when a new kernel starts, drivers try to probe devices. Uh, the devices are in states that cannot be handled uh, at the probing stage by, uh, by the drivers, so this, uh, this will need uh, investigation. Uh, Although we weren't much into uh, providing user land tools, uh, just a few bits to, to load the kernel started, uh, we found the uroot uh, used in Linux boot, for example, uh, to be a very nice piece of uh, software for that. Much better than, uh, in our opinion, much better than other such uh, toolboxes. Uh, alas, it doesn't support uh, k-exec on ARM. We had to use k-exec tools, and, and, but that's just a minor uh, problem. Uh, thanks to TMPFS, uh, which unlike old style uh, RAM disk, is able to expand uh, in RAM as new data is saved, we could split our init RAM FS archive into two. The first stage uh, comprises only a tiny init we call half in its, uh, half stage init, uh, which mounts FAT partition, unpacks stage two archive, or stage one full archive, execute slash init that uh, is expected to be in the archive, and replaces uh, HS init. Uh, there is no limit for the stage two archive, except of course the size of RAM, uh, size and speed of uh, storage uh, and such things. Uh, Uroot, short for universal root, uh, is, is a really nice piece of software I'd like to recommend you if you build bootloading environments. It is a set of basic tools. There is a shell, a text editor, LS, cat, and you know, stuff that you find in all the boxes out there. Uh, but unlike other boxes, it is written in Go. Uh, it can be deployed in two modes, source 
and busy box mode. The former is neat because uh, uh, the only uh, binary that uh, is uh, uh, on, uh, on the init RAM FS is, a, is Go compiler and every tool that you use is compiled on demand. Uh, unfortunately, it requires uh, much more space and uh, rather strong CPU. On ARM, it was too slow to, to build the commands. Uh, the busybox mode is a single binary with multiple symlinks uh, uh, calling multiple functions. Uh, at the moment, uh, what we've got, we can configure the kernel to build a, uh, an uh, image for a selected board, in our case it is XU4, uh, to boot without U-boot and start another fully fledged kernel. Uh, Although XU4 cannot act as a USB device, uh, to use Linux on other our boards, we need to develop FunctionFS-based tool to receive files, to, to, to receive and uh, download to, to the flash. We also need to uh, make kexec tool in Uroot work on ARM. Why, <laughs> you may ask. From our perspective, there are following uh, advantage, advantages uh, to this approach. Less effort during platform bring up. Because we avoid code duplication, this extends also to maintenance. You don't end up with, I don't know, for example, uh, PMIC uh, driver into uh, repositories in Linux kernel where you need it for power management and in bootloader where you need it to, to bring up the platform. Uh, uh, Linux, uh, more flexibility. Linux, both the kernel and the user land is much more capable and flexible than, uh, than bootloaders available. Two areas we, uh, we consider crucial are network support and security. Although it is possible to boot uh, over a network today, only TFTP is available for file transfer, which is perfectly fine from a client perspective. Uh, however, without an authentication, it is not a protocol I would deploy outside any local network. Support for uh, crypto libraries is very new and uh, quite limited as far as I can tell. Uh, and finally, from our experience, uh, the general pur purpose code like file systems, like uh, network stack, uh, like, uh, I don't know, USB stack, not, not the driver for, for, the, for the hardware, but the rest of the stack, is somewhat is somewhat in better shape in uh, in the Linux kernel and is uh, maintained uh, more regularly. That that is our experience. Uh, in summary, the the key features of our approach of what we did, uh, we are definitely ARM centric because that's the platform we work with. Uh, we assume, however, it, that it applies directly to other platforms which don't employ standards-based firmware, uh, like BIOS or U, uh, like BIOS or UEFI. Our motivation to push, Lin push Linux as close to the hardware as possible is a little different than on x86. We are not concerned. Uh, we are not concerned much about uh, security. Uh, like uh, management engine on 86 that affect platforms user, uh, but rather we want to help vendors, ourselves included, to minimize the effort uh, to prepare, to, to bring up the platform, to avoid the, the unnecessary effort to prepare two versions of device drivers and uh, keep uh, file, file systems up to date and so on and so on. Our goal is to find a place and means in the Linux kernel source tree to keep platform board dependent code 
which can, uh, which can do platform setup uh, before the kernel starts and can be, uh, oh, phew, uh, and can be built together with the kernel to form a single binary that uh, the, the firmware, the, the ROM bootloader can, uh, can load, alternatively uh, signed SPL. Although this might look like we try to resurrect port files, we don't. The platform uh, specific code that we need uh, is, is, com is not the same as, as uh, the, the board files that were used before uh, device tree became popular. Uh, the code needs to bring up only several components, uh, which are not accessed, which are not controlled uh, later on. With, uh, with this in place, uh, porting Linux would require less effort less amount of work and you get really, really powerful boot environment. Uh, these are the guys that help me a lot by either uh, providing uh, knowledge or allowing me to work on this as a side project and special thanks go to uh, Mateusz who wrote the, the, the small init, the HS init and squeezed it really hard to, to, to fit uh, in the limit. Okay, I managed somehow. Are there any questions? I guess it's more, oh, oh, this is loud. I guess it's more a comment than a question, um, but I guess the question comes along. Uh, first off, I think it's an amazing idea to uh, use Linux as your driver toolkit because then you only write your drivers once, right? Um, doing those in, in U-boot and in Linux at the same time is a terrible idea either way, um, simply because we, we, you always get this typical fork effect where you um, have diverging drivers for, like sooner or later. The big issue I see is, um, your, how do I put this? Um, the platform init code is something that the ARM world was really proud of to finally get rid of. I don't see us reinventing that in, or re reintroducing it in, in a 64 bit ARM world. It just is not going to happen. Um, we need to find a different way to get this tiny platform init code uh, in between your, basically, your BL2 and the, the actual Linux kernel. And this is where I really would like to brainstorm with you on, on cool ideas we can do. I think we have a couple of, of things on the plate of what is possible um, to create a tiny shim that uh, runs before Linux so that you don't have to put platform code into, in, into the, the Linux kernel itself and the tree itself. Mm, I'm very sorry, but the, there was something I... I could you come and <laughs> quick, quick repeat me the question without the mic? Without the mic. Um, the platform init code you're putting into Linux kernel, right? Before the Linux kernel. So is it actually separate standalone code? It's or a single it file. But it's in Linux. Uh, in the source tree. Yes. I think we need to work on untangling this. Uh, okay, the question, the question was, uh, is the shim we, you, we prepend to Linux it. kernel oh, inside the crazy. kernel tree? Yes, we want to be it inside the kernel tree. And uh, I haven't mentioned that. I have posted patches, RFC patches to, to the lists, and they are available for commenting. So it's, it's not like we want to push something. We want to discuss it, because Linux kernel, the, the source tree, can become a single, single stop shop for, for vendors, for people, to boot you know, code that boots. That's, we, we're definitely open for discussion. Out of the room, please keep somehow silent to let the speaker finish the talk. Thank you. Okay, it appears I, I finished. I think we have time, sir. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I thank you too.